Welcome to the Spirit of Wolf podcast. My name is Luke. I'm Richard, and I just got my master's degree in divinity. Everyone has a different perspective, so we're bringing on all sorts of people from different walks of life, like Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, atheist, and more, to discuss the biggest spiritual and moral questions and how they see it in their philosophy. Our goal is to find where we agree and disagree, and hopefully challenge ourselves to be better people in the process. Together, we shall dive deeper <laughs> and get weirder. Miss Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black with silver buttons, buttons, buttons all down her back, back, back. She asked her mother, mother, mother for 50 cents, cents, cents to see the elements, 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 Nice. All right. Bring him on so in. So he is coming Eve, in. Eve, Eve, Let's Eve, invite Eve, him Eve, to Eve, the Eve. thing. Let me just hit record. All right, he should be on the headphone. Oh, there we are. Hey. Hello, hello. Hey, thanks for joining us. Oh, he's even got the cool yeah. RGBs going on in the corner. Man. <laughs> oh. He's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice little little gamer setup you got going there. He's playing Fortnite in the background for sure. <laughs> I don't know if you can I don't know if you can see those 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 like buckets back there. Are they vomit buckets or <laughs> but kind of the opposite. When the pandemic hit, my wife sort of freaked out a little bit and bought. It's like it's food that never goes bad, you know. It's like it's like prepper, like prepper food. <laughs> Wait, what's what's in there? Is it just like oats and like canned dog food? No, there's a. It's like a whole little. En- it's an entree bucket. Oh, it's got 60, 60 servings in hey, it. Hey, mom, what's for servings. dinner? A bucket. <laughs> entree bucket again. <laughs> just, yeah, just reach into the entree. Bucket. Value entree bucket. I love it. Yeah, I was thinking about what we might be talking about, and uh, yeah, I don't know. We're, 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 we're going to follow the journey. I, I, yeah, but thanks for having me. You know, I it is I, it's cool to it's cool to have these kind of conversations because yeah, most people I, I ruin a lot of parties when I try and start these kind of conversations. <laughs> I ruin, but you know, people don't want to in the wrong it. social group. Yeah, I am. I think I am. Well, that that's one thing that we felt really strongly about was like having these deep sort of philosophical religious conversations was is hard to do. And just there's a taboo nature around it. Right. Like you just don't go and talk to someone about like, hey, what's your experience with God? Like in, in, a, in a low key way, it just doesn't happen. So we wanted to create this podcast as a place to do that in a more like earnest way. Anyway, uh, my name's Luke. I guess we should give introductions here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just kind of rolled right into it. My name's Luke. I'm Richard. Yeah, and this is the Spiritable Podcast. All right. Were you, were you introducing to yourselves to me? I or was. You, I was, yes, just in case you weren't aware. <laughs> right. Cool. Well, I'm going to give you a, a little bio here. Uh, it was really fun learning about you. Uh, you've been uh, in the music industry for more than 20 years, uh, from your first big hit, which was Moment in the Sun, into a more recent Chobani Greek yogurt ad, which I watched and I loved, by the way. You, you were the highlight of that ad for me. And then just recently, you came out with uh, Forever Just Beyond with Scott Avitt, which is kind of how we connected with you um, after kind of a five-year hiatus. So it it's feels like it's been a, been a long journey for you and one that in a couple articles I was reading, said you said that you had some significant ups and downs with, including filing for bankruptcy and trying to figure out, you know, if this was your path versus something that you just wanted to do, something you were called to do versus just wanted to do, all kinds of ups and downs in there. So... Um, yeah, it was it was fun learning that about about you, and it seems like you're in a pretty good place now. But I'll let I'll let you be the factor there. Well, I mean, yeah, I would say that my whatever whatever you could broadly define as my spiritual uh, you know <laughs> journey, I would say. Uh, well, no, I've been. I mean, I've been. I should give myself more credit. I've been I've been searching for since I was a young man. Yeah. But, uh, but what really sort of kicked it into high gear was, uh, failure, uh, you know, like about 10 years ago, my, I just, yeah, kind of had a, a midlife crisis, you could say, sure. where I was just kind of getting up to, to 40, you know, I was putting my, my, myself sort of out there in, in the world and the world wasn't, uh, wasn't feeling me so much, you know, like things just weren't working out. so. So yes, and that's you, that's what led to the sort of bankruptcy. Being being spiritual is more um, just having to yeah, having to confront yourself. You know what I'm saying? And 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 every time every time you you're forced to kind of re 
reinvent yourself or reconfigure yourself is an opportunity to maybe, yeah, to experience yourself in a, in a bigger, in a, just a wider way. You yeah. Know, beyond I, I do, I do a decent amount of work with, uh, like, uh, teenagers and, and I run a bunch of summer camps. And one thing that I like to always say, if given like, uh, if I'm giving a chapel or something, one point that I like to drive home is that you're only going to be around one person for your entire life until the day you die. And that's yourself. So you might as well make yourself someone that you want to be like, and you want to be around. But anyway, we're getting far into the deep end. So let's, let's back <laughs> yeah. up a little bit. I know Richard, right. you want to. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a question. Yes. Sir. Um, sure. what, would you say that your worst spiritual experiences and what would you say your best spiritual experiences? Um, wow. <laughs> I don't mind. Well, I'm not even, I'm not, in, let me ask you. So what, what do you mean by spiritual experience? I mean, yeah, if you, just give me what yeah, that's I'm just question. wondering. I think that can mean a lot of things for a lot of different people. Um, we've had guests on that have said that they've had intense otherworldly experiences like near-death experiences like near-death of. experiences and stuff like that we've had guests on that say their most powerful spiritual experiences going on a walk with their dog or having dinner with friends um so or more, more overtly religious like mine was having being in an evangelical christian youth group and feeling so uncomfortable with some of the content that was happening that it was just i felt like a very negative space for me so yeah, it can the, take the all negative forms spiritual experience i mean i've had I've had there's I have moments of of what I like to call reverie. And there's moments when I when I just you know, it isn't anything that dramatic if you were just looking at me, but it's it's a, it's moments when my mind just clears, you know, when when I can when the chatter in my mind I mean, it's taking me years to get to the point where and it kind of depends on what's going on in my life. Obviously, sometimes life is more stressful than others, right. but moments when when I'm alone, uh, like I drive a lot, you know, I play home shows. So there's when I'm on tour, I, I'm often alone. And if I'm in the car and I'm, and I'm just driving somewhere beautiful, you know, it doesn't have to be breathtakingly beautiful, yeah. but just a beautiful day. You know what I'm saying? There's moments when... Somehow you get this sense. I just, I don't know how to describe it. I I call it a reverie, and I and I feel a deep, yeah, just aliveness. Yeah, you know, and uh, and it's like a wordless sort of joy. You know, it it, it doesn't like a, like a stillness, calm be, sort of. Yeah, I, all those words. I mean, I I'm not going to find any new words to <laughs> but Yeah, stillness, and so in so I would say those are my best. Mm. moments and those moments can come at any time you know i and i try to orient my thinking and my actions such that i can that i find myself in those moments mm. and then i don't you know i don't i don't know about worst like i i didn't have you know you were alluding to to yeah being in some kind of a organized I mean, that, was, that was just me yeah situation so i like i was raised without any religion okay, at all my parents were very atheistic and very, you know, sort of godless Jews. So in a way I don't have, I don't have any, any of that sort of experience, which, um, anyway, so yeah, so I'm not, so I'm going to cop out a little bit and say, <laughs> I don't know what my worst one is. I don't have a worst one. No, that's, right, that, right. that's fine. That's I'm, fine. I'm curious. Uh, you say you try to orient your life to have more of these moments of reverie. What, what does that look like? Like, what is it a, is it a mindset change is it specific actions throughout the day? What, what kind of things do you do to try to bring that kind of pure joy state more often? I, I mean, sure. There's, there's things, you know, I'm, I'm a little older now. I probably I don't look as old. I'm just turned 50, <laughs> you know, and I got, I got two kids. One of my kids is, is already about to turn 18. Wow. So in a way, I, I don't think I, I could have, felt or thought this way. I mean, I certainly didn't when I was younger. So this is definitely like a second half of life kind of thing. You know, you guys look kind of young to me. So, you know what I'm saying? So it might, it might week. not apply, <laughs> you know, it might not apply as much. Like you might not even, you know, whatever. I'm just saying that the part of being able to do this is, 
is getting older. And so as I've gotten older, also, like, I don't, I don't feel, you know, like my body doesn't have that same, my body feels more you, at ease. Out, sort of. yeah. yeah. Like I don't have that kind of edgy, yeah. like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm horny. I'm like <laughs> restless. I'm, oh, you know, that kind of youthful, like energy that sort of like yeah. dies down. I'm, I'm hoping for that. Yeah. I just feel like I'm, I'm operating like 10 out of 10 all the time, like firing on all cylinders. It's yeah. hard for me to find that moment of like revelry. When I was younger, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I was there. I was very angst ridden, but it, you know, but it's not, that's just part, that's just part of it. You know, part, it is kind of like, I play music a lot. Really? You know, I, I get up, really, <laughs> I get up very early. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, I try. I get up really early in the morning. Um, and I, I have a little, I'm in my basement right now and everyone's asleep upstairs. They can't hear me. And, uh, and I, yeah, I just, I work on music, you know, um, and then I go for a walk and we live near this beautiful area, uh, here in West Nashville. Nice. What's your specific address? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you have some chaotic energy today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not a real concern that people are going to come stalk oh, my house, man. but I guess that probably should. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. We'll, we'll be come. there. So yeah, I do, uh, I don't. I have a, I have a strange life cause I don't, oh, it's hard to even know what it is right now because of all this quarantining and stuff. Like, all right, I'll tell you, I'll give you my, my, this is my spiritual wisdom. Okay. Right, this is what Ready. I, I knew. I was like, Oh, I gotta give these guys something that I've, I've worked out. <laughs> so I think the way to approach life. Okay. Is to live it like a surfer. Okay. You can think of life as a kind of giant surfing tournament. And, uh, and, and you can think about where you, you know, each, each position in that situation is a sort of, is like a, a kind of archetype of society. Like there's the surfers, right? Everyone, and, and they're like, you could say like the Elon Musks and the Joe Rogans or whatever sure. are kind of like the surfers, you know, or you know, Michael Jordan, you yeah, know, yeah, the people yeah, know who are really like, have excellent. And, and there's only, that's like 1%. There's not, most people aren't going to be the surfers. Anyway, but this applies more broadly that you could live like this. Oh, I messed up. I overcomplicated my metaphor already. Right, let me go back. Let me go back. The, the surf tournament was uh, trying to elaborate on. But even if you're not, if you, if you, I try and live like a surfer, I guess maybe it's not applicable to everyone. I'll just say that. So how does a surfer live, right? First of all, you got to, first of all, you got to have some skills. You got to be able to surf, right? right? So whatever you're trying to do, you got to, got to get, got to know how to do it. And you got to do it pretty well. So anyway, but in doing it, obviously you get better. So first you surf out into the water that takes, you know, it's cold. It's a little scary. And then you, so you surf out past the breakers and then you wait. Okay. So you have to be patient. Right. And, uh, so you have to be strong and patient and then, and then you have to, when you're, when you're, you got, you can't chase after every wave. You have to really kind of know when it's your wave. Right. So this is a way of being sort of an opportunity or a, or a big decision, let's yeah. say. And then, and then you have to be, you have to be graceful and you have to have the courage to ride, to go for it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So a lot of people don't, a lot of people, yeah, I don't, you know, they get scared, but like, you can't be scared. You have to, and in a sense, yeah. So then, and then if you catch it, if you catch that wave, then you're in, that, you know, like think about that moment that a surfer is in the wave. Like that's a transcendent moment. You know what I'm saying? It's right between chaos and order. You're frozen in between chaos and order. Your consciousness is mediating between chaos and order in this perfect, like a surfer does it in the most literal way that you can think. So if you kind of apply that to just how you, how you live, you know, you got to be patient. You got to wait for your wave. Okay. And when you catch it, you got to ride it. And, and then you have, you know, you have those transcendent moments and those moments are the best moments in, in life. Those are the most meaningful and the most, yeah, those just those, because that's when you're in the yeah. flow. You're I, like, really, I, re you're I right. really like that. R R Richard, yeah. how do you feel like, cause I, I have some ways where that specifically like resonated with me. Did that, how, how's the surf analogy, Eve surf analogy show up for you? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking about that. And, uh, I was thinking about a specific moment where, um, so I, I just graduated a seminary program, a theological school program, and I'm actually being ordained this Sunday. 
which is pretty cool. Um, uh, but while I was in school, I had a moment where, you know, I had, it was nine at night and I had a presentation at nine the next morning that I hadn't started and I knew I was going to be up all night long and I was kind of talking with someone and I, I, I felt this kind of opportunity to engage with them in a deeper way and like they were in a place where they wanted to talk through some stuff. And so I had like this, I have all this homework that I should be doing and I really wish that I could do it in sleep and this opportunity might never come up again with this person. Um, and so we ended up talking until like 2.30 in the morning. And then so at 2.30, we finally finished our conversation and I started my homework for my presentation at nine and just did it up until my nine o'clock deadline. Um, but I... I don't regret a single piece of it because like you said, like that was for me being there for other people and hearing other people, hearing their stories and, and helping them, you know, be with themselves is such a powerful thing for me. And that feels like that transcendent moment where I could just have the honor of witnessing someone doing their work. Um, so yeah, I would, I would, yeah, that's that's what I thought of with your surfer metaphor, and I definitely wouldn't ever have given that up to do to get four More extra sleep. hours of sleep. Yeah, you've always been someone yeah. to sacrifice sleep for uh, other people. Or <laughs> Who that needs kind of sleep? <laughs> everyone, optional. everyone needs it sleep. It's optional. <laughs> no, I really i I connect with that analogy too. Um, for me, I'm I'm not a patient person. And that's something that I'm I'm trying to work on. But, you know, if I'm out there riding waves, I'm always searching the horizon for the next wave. Or if I'm currently riding a wave, I'm not, like, concentrating on being in the moment and actually, like, looking at this awesome experience that I'm having. I'm always like, okay, well, uh, what's next? Uh, we're, I'm not doing anything. Like, what's next? So it's really hard for me to appreciate that, that wave while I'm riding it. So I, I, I really like that analogy. Thank you for that little tidbit of wisdom there. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, uh, I have... I'm like sports, uh, sport. There's, there's one other one too that I just saw recently. It was this vice. It was one of those vice, you know, clips okay. about, yeah, about it's like a little 10 or 50 minute about, uh, this rodeo rider out in North Carolina, who's breaking all the records. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy's like the Jimi Hendrix of rodeo, you know, just, and uh, I can't remember his name, JD something. And so they just, they followed him around. And, and so you're looking at him and you see him with all these other rodeo guys in the green room. And there are all these like really muscular dudes, you know, really tough looking dudes. And he's just a scrawny, <laughs> just a scrawny, it's like 140 pounds, you know, a scrawny little dude. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and then so, you, and then, but then you see him ride the bull and he's, and he just, he just stays on it. You yeah, know, it's, it's like it's a server. Like, he's riding like, it. <laughs> and so that's exactly. So he says, all these other guys think that the secret is to be really strong, but he says, but you're never going to be as strong as the bull. So you have to learn to, to kind of move with the bull, obviously to dance, almost anticipate. And so the way he practices is uh, he just, he just stands on a basketball you know, for hours. And just, he says, it's all about balance. The secret to riding the bull is balance, not mm. strength, you know? And so the bull can be looked at as just life, you know, that if, if you, cause you're gonna, I think the problem people run into with life is that they, they think that when things don't go, they think that failure is failure, but failure is kind of like your, that's your job. Your, gift in a way that's your clay like here this is what you have to like sort this out you know like that's life is all about like i'm a i'm an old testament kind of guy i think life you know i'm a jew right life <laughs> is suffering like it's that's the whole point of it is is that you're gonna suffer and then you turn your suffering into well you turn your suffering into grace hopefully you know but i think a lot of people think that point is to avoid suffering like oh i you know just oops like i don't want to but you can't avoid it you know it's going to visit you one way or another 
Yeah, that idea of avoiding suffering is so interesting because I think it's such a it's such a innate human nature to avoid suffering, you know, physical, mental, spiritual. You but but I think the interesting thing is that when you try to avoid suffering, you don't actually suffer any less. And you deny yourself the opportunity to learn and grow from your suffering. Um, yeah, you don't. And so it just suffering by definition, suffering is something that you don't choose. You know what I'm saying? It's like, obviously if we could choose, no one would choose Actually, it. I don't, I'm going to push back on that slightly because I'm, I'm sort of a masochist in that kind of way. Like I, I know it's not true, but I buy into sort of a deeply karmic sense of if I am suffering, then I'm going to profit from it. So like if I need to like, uh, like lock myself in a closet to figure out this one thing and not let myself out until I do, I'm like forcing the suffering on myself and then I like reap the benefits of it. And it's hard because like I do see, uh, how I can profit from a scenario like that. And I, and I can agree that, yeah, I don't need suffering to succeed or to get this, but it feels like it works at the same time. And the flip side of that is I feel like I often don't deserve something if I haven't suffered for it, you know? Do you, do you feel like if you receive suffering that isn't self-inflicted, how do you feel about that suffering? Um, I see it as a, as a, as a challenge to overcome. Okay, so you don't really make much of a distinction between self-inflicted and outside-inflicted suffering, right? Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate because they're both they're both things that I can kind of grow through and be stronger because of. Hmm. One's just like I'm doing it to myself because it sort of forces my own hand a little bit. Mm. I'm not saying it's the way everyone <laughs> should live. I think I'm kind of a freak, but. Um, and, and it's something that I want to work on because, like I was saying, I want that patience. I want more of that peace. And I think I'm happier when I have those small moments. But it is it is something that I get. What 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 uh, uh, I want to like push back on with suffering is that I think we can all agree that it's not good that people are dying from starvation. Like if we can eliminate very basic human suffering, I think that's something to strive for. Like um, people not having enough food to survive, people not having enough water to survive, people being like tortured to death, like that kind of suffering. I'm 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 pretty okay with saying eliminate that. Thoughts? Yeah. Yes, on board. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I think I'm sorry. You, I I would frame it more this way. All right, if if let's say all right, let's just say you were you were born into a a beautiful loving family on a beautiful island, and you spent your you know, your whole childhood was just spent like traipsing through beautiful meadows. You know, you lived in this like Disney fantasy sure. pretty much, you know, and then, then when you were a little older, you met this beautiful woman and, and you had beautiful children and every day was just this beautiful, uh, and then you grew gently grew older and, and both you and your wife, you know, died in, in your sleep on the same exact night. You know what I'm saying? You just had a life that was completely free of, of any, any, you know, suffering, let's say, right. You just see now, now, and when I describe that in a sense, everyone is kind of striving for that. But then when you, when you spell it out that way, it sounds absurd, you know, doesn't it? Like, of course, like you wouldn't even, would you wish for, for that life? You know, I mean, you can, you can alter it to fit your particular taste, but you know what I'm saying? Like a, a life of just, 98%, Ninety-eight percent, you know, pleasure and two percent pain. I mean, it was just like that. That somehow f- seems wrong, you know. And I think the reason our intuition says that that's wrong is because deep down we know that on some, I don't know, whatever deep level, you know, the the point of life is to confront the inevitable suffering that you're going to face, whatever physical, mental, spiritual, financial. You know, you're gonna you're gonna run into something, yeah, at some point. Yeah, and and I guess the way I look at it is not necessarily that suffering is the point, but suffering is inevitable is an inevitable byproduct of the process of change and growth. Like in the story, the the hypothetical story you just told, it felt really like stagnant and boring. 
Like, did, did these people do anything other than just live and then die? Uh, these old people. I mean, isn't that, is, but isn't that what the, like the culture that we live in, which you could broadly describe as secular kind of, that is the message of it, isn't it? Isn't it just this, like the whole point of life is to, is to be Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> yeah. Who committed suicide, which is, I, that's the reason I mention him because I think his suicide undermines like secular humanism. Yeah. No, that's a great point. In, in a way that, you know what I'm saying? Like, like when you, I mean, I don't have, one of the, one of the things that I wrestle with is like, what is the culture telling me? Like, what is the ideal life? You know, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like what you, you look around and you think, well, what, what, what should I strive for? And, and the culture offers, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you how to draw meaning from your suffering. It just, it just says, Oh, it's a hope that doesn't happen. You know, just, it's more of a kind of yeah. a, 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 a willful sort of denial. You know what I'm saying? That's what, I mean, I think that's the point I was trying to make. No, no, I, I get that. And I, I think maybe what, what Richard was sort of um, hinting at or, or what I'm, I'm picking up is, is I think we're not sort of encouraged to have really positive, deep relationships in our life and, and be a part of a community that's reciprocal where um, you're there for people and people are there for you. And, um, yeah, I think in, in that scenario, like you and this, and this person are removed from society and you can live your beautiful independent life. I think real happiness comes from being able to share that life with people and help people and have people help you and be able to ask for help. I think asking for help is a, a big one right now that we're not at with culture yet, like being able to ask for help. So I, I, I hope that we get to that point where that reciprocal communal nature is more encouraged for a holistic, happy lifestyle. Um, yeah. And, and I think that my, my main thing that I kind of, like you were saying, it sounded absurd, the, the little hypothetical story. Um, and, and the reason it sounded absurd to me is because my mind went immediately to like, these people didn't progress at all in their life, like in their, in their personal identity or, or, or spiritual path. Like there was no, because, because no suffering was described, I, I assumed that no growth happened. And I think for the most part, it's a fairly fair assumption because humans don't like to change. Yeah, and change is innately painful. I think every human on some level or another fears change because it hurts. It's not nice. Um, and, and so when you say like an ideal, idealistic, no pain life, you're also describing a life where people don't strive to be better than they were the day before. And that's like a, like a deeply, although it is yeah, like I, constant joy. Where does, that striving, where, where does that striving come from? Like why? I mean, that's what it's interesting to me. Like why is Jeffrey Epstein reviled or even like, no, that's an extreme example. I was thinking like Harvey Weinstein, you know what I'm saying? Like in some ways, Harvey, and for a long time he was, he, he was a, he, he embodied everything that was not like everything, success. but you know what I'm saying? He was a representative of the culture in a, as a, yeah, as a successful, you know, he was powerful. He, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so like, why, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say the, say it the wrong way here, you know, no, that's all right. I'm not, the, all right, the point go I'm trying to make is it. like, where, where are the, like, where do the morals like where is this morality sort of come from mm. within the culture and and uh, I mean uh, the point I'm trying to make I think is I, I might be getting getting uh, I'm, I'm trying to say too many things at once <laughs> the, the way the culture like the, on the on the one hand the culture is so is so secular you know and so kind of the a cult of sort of selfishness you know where you should just you know, sort of the, the Kardashian sort of version of, of that kind of ideal. And yet, and yet there's also this, this very kind of strict morality. I think the culture is so schizophrenic in that way. Um, mm. No, I think, yeah, that's, no. I think that's a great point. Like, like philosophizing on the morality of culture and where that sort of derives from, because in one sense, you know, America started as a sort of theological safe haven from Europe but also was born of capitalism. So we have this weird mix of like sort of kind of basic Christian ideology 
and also the the materialism of capitalism going through not not to get all like smash the patriarchy but it's it's interesting to try to yeah walk that back to see uh what is the moral being sort of supported by the idea of the perfect life in culture yeah um, yeah and i i do think that that you raise a really interesting point with like weinstein as an example that this person that I bet a lot of people would be like, yeah, I wanted to be him before people knew just because he was a successful, rich guy who had a lot of influence uh, in his in his field. Um, and that's kind of what culture puts up as the ideal. And then suddenly there's a shift where there are certain things that when certain lines that went overstepped, like it's like all of culture together realizes this is unacceptable. And it feels like almost apart from the societal culture we've built up, an innate human response of that's not okay. Um, and it's really interesting to see like, yeah, I think the idea of a schizophrenic culture is pretty spot on with like, let's be all about ourselves and making ourselves as yeah. comfortable as possible until we see something that, truly horrifies us and others and then we want to fight out and change um and it's really interesting that dichotomy and, and i think part of that is because we're getting at the first point in time where transparency is so much more present in society like people's personal lives are getting dragged out into the open for better and for worse um which has never happened before like i mean you know, people used to have to send a telegram for two weeks to just have information travel. But now, because everything's instantaneous and so many people's lives are public, there's this whole transparency that I think has a lot of power uh, for good, too. Like, I know that I, I think it's a good practice to be open about our demons to lessen the power of them. Um, so I think there there's good to be had there. But I we're not we had we don't have an experience as a culture with that yet. Like we just don't have the the timeline to be able to properly deal with that. So we're going to stumble a bit. Yeah, and I think we see that in like society banding together to decide that things are no longer acceptable. Um like with all the protests that are going on right now, I think is a great example of people saying like, "No, this like this is no longer acceptable." But then we also see kind of like the classic like one person for whatever reason becomes like the butt of every internet joke and suddenly their life is ruined for no reason. And, and we see both of these like I think far extreme good and far extreme evil uses of this much more public and connected world. And I think it's just we don't know how to really make good use of it all the time because it's so new. There's, there's always a kind of, uh, yeah, there's always a kind of yin yang symmetry to, to these, these sort of things that are anything sort of really complicated is going to have, you know, it's sort of positive qualities and it's, and it's sort of darker qualities. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what point I was trying to make about, I mean, what point are any of us trying to make? Huh? I mean, in a way, I think, I think it is a spiritual, like, I think it is a spiritual crisis in a way, you know, like the, the counterculture that, 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 uh, that, that came, you know, like this, all the stuff that happened in the sixties that sort of freed people to be, you know, to really focus on themselves and to, and to make, you know, to put yourself sort of at the top of the pyramid. And, and it, and it seemed very, you know, there's like a pagan quality to that, almost like a Roman, you know, where you're, you know, your, your own personal satisfaction and this, and your desires are, are what's, what's paramount. And so, and then now, yeah, there's this, this, this almost kind of hyper Christian, you know, kind of puritanical kind of backlash to that, you know, and Harvey Weinstein, the reason I brought him up is I think he, I remember at one point he mentioned in his defense, he said, I'm from the sixties. Like this is, even like a Bill Cosby, like they, like stuff like that was just more accepted back in the, you know, you could, like if you've ever read uh, that, that electric Kool-Aid acid test, you know, that story about the Tom Wolf writes about like Ken Kesey, it was like the birth of the counterculture. And there's one part in there where, you know, they're the hell's angels come over to some party there at the ranch and they just like gang rape this one dude's wife. 
and and he's cool with it. You know, it's cool, man. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like the counterculture when it first burst out onto the scene was truly pagan, was truly Roman in that way. And so and so now you have this, you know, the grandchildren of these people are, are bringing forth this this almost like new kind of Christianity. It's I mean, that's how it looks to me. And it's and it's kind of wild. You know, it's wild. yeah. humanity always wants to take things to extremes. Like uh, I have this whole like pendulum theory that we, you know, in the ways like like the like the sexual revolution in the in the sixties and seventies, you know, we had the pendulum swing really far to like free expression and free love and that kind of thing. And then you know the pendulum swinging back, it gets to sort of a happy middle. But then we are just inertia carries us through to the other side where we get really like conservative pushback or or like some like non factual things. And then we take it back the other way, and we're kind of always swinging back and forth between ex- between extremes politically, spiritually, socially. And I, I find that usually the middle ground is where, you know, things tend to be pretty chill <laughs> most of the time. But that's yeah. not also how things get done because we need those extremes to, again, see that balance in opposition to what has been and what's going to be. Yeah, well said. Whew. But I, I want to give Eve time to talk about the album too. We got so intense on everything. I loved it. Oh, yeah. uh, so good. Sure. Um, so I, I have a, a question for you, Eve. I was I was running the yep. numbers on your album. I was doing a little science. What do you think oh, okay. the most common words are that you wrote in your new album, which is available everywhere, by the way? <laughs> um, most common words. Name of the album is Forever, Just Beyond, produced by Eve and well, Clem Snide, which I also wanted to ask about, but uh, Clem Snide and Scott Avery. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, why well, I don't know, but God, I know God is mentioned a couple of times, but I don't know. God's not, a... not top five even. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't. Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't. So I, I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, the, the, yeah. the top five are die 11 times down 11 <laughs> times ladder C and no. And then we have bring heart, never, maybe forever mind head hard coming in and uh surprisingly to me <laughs> lamb kebab was only said once in the whole album so i expect that to be at least five or six but yeah no certainly uh it's interesting to die <laughs> <is> <laughs> well you know it, 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 i mean i feel like death was a was a fairly common theme throughout some of them yeah sure i mean i this the record is in a way like a culmination of of the last 10 years definitely the last five years for me but i'd say even 10 and you know however far all the way back to the beginning but right. uh but yeah i don't you know i i mean i my parent my i've always i just have uh i i don't know why i just that's how i my man I, if i'm sort of try to, you know, analyze myself without being, you know, too whatever gauche. <laughs> but I, my, like my grandparents were uh, Polish Jews during the war. And so they managed to escape to Israel. Like my one grandfather literally had to jump off of a boat, you know, that was getting sent oh back. Gosh. At the, at the harbor there and swam to shore. Wow. That's how he got into Israel. Anyway, so, um, so I kind of grew up in the shadow of that, you know? So I, I think it's always, yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've was taken to a lot of Holocaust memorial, you know, as, uh, kind of as, a, as a young man. And my, both my parents were, were kind of dark in their, in their own way, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm just my programming skews towards the tragic, you know, uh, and so it's hard for me to. What do What do you mean by that? That darkness, like your parents being sort of dark. Yeah, they were def. There was just a kind of a black hole at the center of it all. I think I'm drawn towards towards God and towards just understanding or or, or knowing what that is or what that, you know, just yeah, just what that even means in a way because of their rejection of it. Like my grandparents dealt with their experience by rejecting God Mm. and embracing a kind of Zionism, which is a type of Marxism. You know, it has 
it's just a Jewish brand of communism in a way. Right. It just makes the state like the sort of the most important thing. Um, and uh, and then my parents moved to New Jersey, so even their Zionism sort of rings hollow ultimately. <laughs> so I was just kind of thrust into the world, very uh, just as an I was a nihilist. I really was. I was. I failed at it though. I wasn't a good nihilist. But I tried. <laughs> I tried my hardest, you know, as a younger man. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I think I, I just think about death a lot and I feel like I've died. You know, I feel like past versions of me are, are dead. You know, I, I used to be a different person that that person has now d- since died. So yeah, so life and death in a way feel obviously like the same sort of thing. So, so how do you think that you've changed personally and has that been reflected in your music that you've made? Yeah. I used to be a lot more of a smart ass, you know, I think when I first started in my twenties, it was like the nineties and I was, you know, a smart ass, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't that deep and I was just trying to be clever. Were you still clinging to the Zionism I, at the time the, or the nihilism? I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> it was the nineties, uh, nineties was, was uh, it was like early, yeah, sort of early post modernism or something. I'm not even sure what how to describe it. But uh, I, I'd like to think I've gotten, I'd like to think that I've gotten better at what I do. <laughs> you know, sure. like it's very. I realize at some point it's very important for me to feel because it, you know, it's just. When you when you when you're uh, when you uh, uh, play music, it's hard to not feel like your your younger days are kind of your best days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I, I'm Whatever. a I'm an I, actor. I play the kind of music that. Uh, yeah. I, uh, no, no, I was just saying I, I'm an actor, um, and I often feel like I'm 25 now. I already feel like I'm too old. I haven't gotten to where I want to be. Um, my life is behind me in some ways, and that kind of was what I was saying before about always looking to the next thing and not appreciating where I'm at because I feel like I need to play catch up to some degree. So I, I get that sort of artistic outlook on on creativity and, and what you're producing and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing really if, in terms of writing. Like songwriting is a, is a strange process because, um, you know, it's not like you're writing a novel and you have an idea and then you sit down and you sort of work out your idea. Like, I don't ever have an idea. It, it just, I don't even have, I don't know. I have this ongoing kind of itch that is on writing. So I just go and scratch it, I guess, but I never, I can't, I can't go, all right, I'm going to write five awesome songs about this concept. Like I have no control over it in that sense. So, um, I feel like that often produces the best sort of content though, when it, when it's out of your control in a way and, and you're just like a vessel for an idea. I love those kind of moments. Yeah. That's, I guess if anything, that's what I've, I've, I've learned to be more like that. That's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, so yeah. So if anything, and it feels, it feels good, you know, for, it feels good again. And for a while it, it didn't, I've been doing this for so long. I mean, you guys are, guys are still young. I see the sort of twinkle in your eyes. And, you know, when you do something, yeah, like I had my way of doing it when I was in my twenties and then, you know, I was in my thirties. I'd say every, yeah. Okay. I'd say every decade it, it breaks down pretty, pretty evenly in that way. You know, like every, every decade of your life, you're kind of a different person. Hmm. I think I like person I was in my twenties wasn't really who I was in my thirties. And then, you know, every, yeah, every decade is like a different iteration of you. And hopefully each one, it, it doesn't improve necessarily, but it, you know what I'm saying? Hopefully you, you find with each one, I think I've, I hope, like a fine I'm, one. you know, we'll see how it, exactly. You just age and you, and you get more patient and you get more like relaxed and you're not, you know, you don't sweat small stuff anymore. All that, all those cliches, hopefully well, if, if every if every decade you're a new person, are you about to be a new person, or are you very newly a new person? Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, I've just turned fifty, so we'll see how my fifties go. You know, they're. I mean, they're off to a great start, but then all this all this uh, madness that's unfolding now is is uh, you know I'm not sure where, how that's going to play out. Yeah. Like for everyone, obviously. All right, well, here's we'll see. here's the important question though. What is your secret? 
How are you 50 years old? Yeah, I am. I'm very where because you've done a lot of traveling. So where is the fountain of youth? How often do you get car? How often do you get carded at bars? Still? And what's your skincare routine? We are deeply curious. I know. I'm, it's, I wish I try to sound like a wise old man, but then people look at me and they go, I, "You don't, you know." It's like my credibility is, is kind of shaky. <laughs> well, I see. I need to grow. You I see the you're gray, gray, on the gray a little bit so, here. It gives you some credibility. <laughs> I, it's weird. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know what my secret. <laughs> Good genetics. My secret is I'll tell you cold showers. You do cold showers? I only take cold I only take cold showers. Oh man. Wow. Save your oh, life. I was a master. Save your life. Um and uh <laughs> and I highly recommend like a probiotic, like a kombucha, you know, something with uh like, you're, you're playing into our producer's natural, dreams. He he ferments his own stuff all the time. Yeah. Uh, I do too. I brew my own, I make my own like ginger Hell beer yes. and stuff. That, Amazing. And, uh, I'm know, not on screen, but like that is, uh, you know I live for yeah. other people fermenting stuff at home. It's very exciting. I'm trying to get all my friends in on it. I got, I got Luke yeah. teased a little bit. He might, he might get on it. He didn't. <laughs> he just before the podcast started, gave us some like sweet potato, a sweet potato fermented. nutmeg and cinnamon. It's called a sweet potato fly. See, there you go. It, it's fine. There's something to it. Wow. Wait, are you using a ginger bug or yeah. a scope? I grew my own ginger <laughs> bug at home. That's how I'm doing it. Nice. But we're also doing kombucha. I mean, wow. Welcome to, great time. Well, welcome to Kombucha Podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's a podcast within a podcast. Bro, I got my brother into it and we just we just talked fermenting. He, show, he sends me pictures of his like, look how much, you know, I got these many bubbles. Look at the bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, I swear by it, man. It really it makes you feel so much better when you're doing it yourself. It's It's so active, I think. You know, it's not just, and you take the pills or whatever, it doesn't do anything. And I, yeah, it gives me like, woo. I mean, that's what cold showers, like, you know, long hikes. I mean, I ultimately you just kind of, you just got to hack your body. I mean, I went through years of depression and, and misery. And had I known if, if I had just gone on a good long hike and drank some, some fermented, see, I probably would have felt much better. You know what I'm saying? Like you. What happened? The audio, we lost audio. Oh no. Hold on, Ben's fixing it. You guys got Oh, there quiet. we go. There uh -huh. we go. Can you hear us? Yeah. We're back. No, when, I, when I was younger, I smoked cigarettes, you know, I ate crappy food. I didn't I didn't take care of myself at all and I felt like crap, you know. Mm. And then as I got older, I realized that if you if you if you, if you, if you don't eat crap, care. you don't feel like crap. Surprise, surprise. You feel pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's my revelation, you know, that uh, I think a lot of, I mean, you know, I have the depression and so I have to, I have to push against it and, and, and you do need, it starts with the body, you know, body and mind. But yeah, if you, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can put your, your body in a good place and your mind will sort of Yeah, and again, it goes back to the balance that we were talking about, having everything kind of be at their at their peak by being in balance. I feel like so many people are like, oh, why do I feel like crap? And they're not drinking any water. They're not eating any vegetables. It's like, uh, Don't oh, yeah, God, I'm, I'm looking directly this? at Richard during <laughs> How this. How dare you? I eat at least one meal a day, okay? <laughs> oh, you're, you're, still, you're still young. When you're in your 20s, you can, you can abuse you can it. Kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, don't worry too much. I'm getting out of my system but now. But I want to swing back around to when you were talking about um, your album and uh, kind of you constantly searching for God or, or whatever that means and, and that sort of thing. And, and the, the song that's, I guess, the, the front song to your album um, about the last words of uh, Roger Ebert. Um, what a cool so, idea for a song. But. Yeah, I, I loved it. And afterward, I did a bunch of Googling about Ro the story of, of Roger Ebert's last words. And it's so fascinating. I just love to hear... Uh, I also saw some stuff about how that that story was a pretty powerful thing in your life. I was just wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about your experience with that story. I mean, I, I go down that near death experience rabbit hole on YouTube sometimes. You know, I I find I find comfort in 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 that. Sure. You know, people telling those stories. I, yeah. So well, and then somehow that led me to that interview with his with his. Uh, with his wife Chaz, and uh, and yeah, I just I saw that interview with her, and that's what, and it's really just it struck me um, that uh, what, were, what were his yeah, final words? Was, an, an elaborate hoax, right? It's all an elaborate hoax. He was, it's like he was starting to see. Yeah, he had one foot kind of on the other side already. You know, it was like the 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 veil, the veil of tears. You know, it was he was starting to see past it, and. Uh, 
I mean, I've talked to her. I've, I've had a conversation with her about yeah. it since. And um, I mean, she didn't necessarily give me any more information, but I think he, and also the fact that he, that he, that he loved movies so much and, and the way, it, you know, that, that he viewed life as a kind of movie, you know, that it worked on a lot of different levels as far as a song goes. But, uh, but I mean, you're asking what, what, yeah, I don't know. That just spoke to my just intuition of, 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 I, I do my, my, my sense of it is that there, that this is the dream, you know what I'm saying? That like upon death, the, the true reality is revealed. Like, that's just, that's just, I don't know if I just want to believe that, or if I do, like I've, I've gone deep inside myself and asked, like, do you think that because you just want to think that, or do you really think that? And I, and I really do. Like, it just rings true to me. Right. I don't know why. So I honor that feeling. And that is, if anything, that's my spiritual feeling. I think that's where the rubber meets the road with spirituality is like, do you believe that your deepest kind of sense of self just continues on past your bodily death? You know yeah, what I'm saying? I, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, that is, you know, like that's where it gets good. Yeah. It's like right at that yeah. moment. I think it's so fascinating. You see in so many depictions, like the classic cheesy depictions of the afterlife, like it's all, it's all hazy and everyone's kind of just lounging about or like playing a harp or, or, or something. And no one really seems to be doing much and it all feels really dreamlike. And, and I don't know. I, I could my, see Eve lazing around playing a harp and having a great time though. Well, fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite ideas about the religion that I'm a part of, that I'm about to be a minister in, is this idea of we are our spirits, we are our minds, we're not our bodies. And actually, the after we are no longer conscious in our bodies, it's not it's not some dreamlike state. State it's like waking up from a dream. Um, where yeah. you suddenly don't have any of the limitations of the body. Like you don't, you haven't eaten. And so you feel kind of groggy or something like that. Your mind is, is crisper. It's, it's fresh. It isn't limited in the yeah. same way. And I just, that's a really cool idea and always like kind of just deeply wrong as true for me. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's remove that veil a little bit. What, what do you think happens after you die? Like what's, what's your idea of the afterlife right now? Do you have a, have a picture of that? Um, or does that matter? I mean, yeah, I don't, you know, it's a, there's a part of me that also just can't conceive of, of my, of my disembodied self, you yeah. know, because, and what would, yeah, what would I do? You know, like, what is there to do if, if you don't have a body? But, but then at the same time, I, I've, you know, I, yeah, like I was saying before, I've, I've, I feel like I've, I've died, you know, that there's, there's always that constant part of you, you know, there's always that, that kind of, you're just your unfiltered consciousness or whatever you want to call it. That's just always there. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? That just, that just turned on. Like you had no, you had no agency in it's, in it's being turned on. Like you're just thrown into the world and you just find yourself as who you are. But that, that sort of initial like, bing, you know, where you're just, like you wake up in the morning, your eyes just open, you know, you don't, you don't choose to open them. You, you know what I'm saying? Like life, like in a way you're just, you're just like a little, you're like a little flashlight of, of some sort of life energy and, and you're just sort of turned on. So it seems to me that, that you're always that energy, you know what I'm saying? Like, because it's, because it's just there, you know, the, the fact that you don't, that's what, that's what makes me feel like there is some eternal quality to it because just in the fact that you don't choose any of it. You don't choose to be born. You don't choose your body. You know what I'm saying? You're, it's like chosen for you. So in, in a sense, the, you know, the you like that is a body and that has a name and, and has, you know, is like certain things and doesn't like other things. Like, yeah, that's more the, the ephemeral part and the, and just the kind of bing, just the, the sort of ringing bell awareness seems eternal to me. It just feels like, how can it not be? You know, mm. it has, it has to be eternal but, as much. But as do you think, do you think that consciousness part of you, I mean, you don't choose to be conscious to, to have that light happen or not. 
Uh, but over time, I think you choose what that looks like, right? You know, there's you're you're a new you than you were ten years ago, and I think with each of us, we choose the new us that we become. And, and in in my mind, that's that's the part that's eternal. Um, is who we're how how we how we start with this basic consciousness and then shift it over time to something that we've created. Yeah, yeah. The part that's eternal is what we create as ourselves apart from, you know, I'm six foot one and I have red hair like that. That doesn't matter. And I often like I've had this weird thing recently where I look in the mirror and I'm like, that's not what I look like. That's not <laughs> what, what I, sh- <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why, but I look in the that's mirror. Just and I'm called like, body that's, dysmorphia, my friend. I'm like, that's not what I should look, but it's not like I feel uncomfortable in my own body, but I'm like, it's not, it's not quite right. And I think just the nature of having a physical body, we don't decide anything about it. Yeah. Like, I mean, other than like stuff we put in for for fitness and things like that, but I don't decide what my face looks like. Um, and I, I think that there's a, a in my belief system, uh, after death, it's not that you're just a disembodied like puff of smoke or wisp. It's that you have a body that is uh, a a perfect representation of who you are, oh, right, um, right. and and that's just interesting. I wonder, you know, what little what little tweaks will happen to me, what I'll look like. Just always thought I just always think about it, yeah. like, and I don't. I, well, just, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, I've heard. I know my. Me and my wife have talked about this. Like, if you talk, if you ever have a conversation with a with a, a much older person, sometimes they'll say, "You know, I still feel like a seventeen year." Like, I look in the mirror and I see this, this old person looking back at me. You know, and I mean, I get that sometimes, even though I still look so freakishly <laughs> so, young so. for my age, <laughs> beautifully but, innocent. But, you know, there's moments when. When, uh, yeah, I think maybe when you're really old, you know, and your face is just, is just completely all shriveled up that you, yeah, you would look in the mirror and, 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 and not recognize yourself, you know, because yeah, your intuition is as a self that is eternal, mm. you know? Yeah. So that's, I mean, I don't, I, yeah, I can't, I need to, I need to hang it onto something more tangible. That's, I don't know. I just try to get good songs out of it. You know, no, that's, no. That's, I think, and, and that's one thing we're big on is is bringing spirituality down to earth and, and seeing what tangible things we can get out of it. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but I do, I do want to be cognizant of your time. We're coming up on an hour here. Um, oh yeah, I do need to go pretty yeah, soon. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I. It was funny. I was doing research. I was listening to your album. I had so many like. I wanted to go through each song, uh, each song of the album, song by song, and dissect some of the lyrics, but we don't have time for it. Um, oh, no, that's all right. But uh, a quick one to say, one of my favorite quotes uh, was from your song Forever Just Beyond, which the album's named after. Uh, it was just one little section where you just said, worrying, worrying is praying to the devil. And I really liked that. Like, I don't know, that just really rings true to me. Like, that's exactly what, I don't know, like evil as a concept once is us to worry and that's giving that devotion to something dark. I don't know. It just really, I, I really like that. I really like that part. So thank you for that little, little gift. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know what your favorite song on the album is, um, but I really liked, uh, which one was it? Don't Bring No Ladder. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why it like it rung true for me so, so much. But I loved it, and I'm curious about what it means because I feel like most of the other ones I could kind of intuit what you were going for, but this one was a little bit trickier for me. So I was wondering, it might sound weird on Zoom, but I was wondering if you would do us the honor of playing a little bit of it and then telling us a little bit of what it was about before you have to leave here. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Wait, let me see. Awesome. Uh, can you hear yeah, me? I can hear you loud and yeah. clear. All right, I'll play some Don't Bring No Ladder. Oh, yeah. um, um, all right, I'm playing. We are a wave endlessly 
breaking We are the ever-seeing eye We've never left the place we're searching for Sails inside a bottle. We hang the moon and paint the sky. There's never a seed left in the lifeboat. Don't bring no ladder when you die. Don't bring no ladder. I love it. I love it. I think I think the stands that stood to me was the we raise our sails inside a bottle, we hang the moon and paint the sky. There's never a seat left in the lifeboat. Don't bring a ladder when you die. So yeah, could you talk to me a little bit about that? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's maybe suggesting the extent to which the extent for me. I'll tell you what the song kind of means for me uh, is is just to live. Yeah, don't bring a ladder. Like, die. Don't die with regrets and resentments. You know, sort of die clean. Hmm. You know. So what does um, what does that ladder represent? Like, are you lowering the ladder back down to where you are? are? You like, is it like a safety? Well, thing? it's like so you think. It's almost like you think maybe after you die, you'll be able to. Like, you're not you're not going to make it to heaven, but 
when you die, you'll bring a ladder and then so like sneak up to heaven or something. You know, it's like, don't, don't tr- just, just be true. It's basically like be true to yourself, you know, know that like don't, yeah, don't lie to yourself, you know, try to just be as true to yourself as you can. I, I don't think. wait and then die with regrets about who you could have been. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't, I don't know what these songs mean. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't start. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't, it doesn't start with the, the, the concept or the, the me- message necessarily. It is just like, I, I can just feel when it has that feeling that seems to suggest it's, it's all a kind of a, just an intuitive sort of feeling, you know, in the, in the way of writing a good song is, you know, don't bring a, don't bring a ladder. Yeah. To the song. <laughs> That's cool. Or, well, I, I respect that philosophy a lot. Well, man, I know you. I know you had to leave, so I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us on here, playing us some music, talking about your album, and philosophizing about the vagaries of life. That was, that was really fun. I'm an open book, man. I'm an open book. I appreciate I got no about secret. you. Well, um, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, why, don't, why don't you plug plug your album for everyone? And plug your. I know you're going on tour. You're going to be in Philly like July 25th, Uh-oh. right? Something like that. Uh-oh. No, it got canceled. There's no tour. <gasps> Shame. I was. I was. I was excited. Everything's been postponed. That makes sense. I know. I've just been in the basement here, you know. <laughs> eating out of your so bucket, I'm wasting away. Thinking, <laughs> yeah, eating out of my bucket. <laughs> on trade bucket. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about these things. I hope it made some sense. And, uh, and then, yeah, so I'm also promoting a record called Forever Just Beyond, as you mentioned, uh, that was produced by a certain Scott Avis. And you can get it wherever you get your music. It'll be there. Clem Snide. Clem Snide. Forever just be on. Awesome. Well, well, Eve, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. Awesome, man. Take it easy. All right. Farewell. See ya. All right. And that was Clem Snide, the band. Eve Barzillet, the man. We, we got away without saying his last name in fear. Yeah, he's so interesting. Like, I was a little unclear about, like, his wavelength when he first showed up. Like, he seemed a little hesitant, and then he was, like, just got right into it, which was so I, cool. I, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I'm really sad that he's not going on tour, because I was like, he, he originally planned on being at, like, Milk Boy Studios on the 25th, and I, it would be so much fun to show up. Yeah, I mean, we could have easily like gotten a beer with him. I, he, he'd be really fun to just sit down and have a beer with and have a good time. And like, just a really good guy. I do really like his. I've appreciated when I was younger. I did not appreciate the artistic philosophy of being like, I don't know what it means. You figure it out, which is not entirely what he was doing. But like that was something that always triggered me a little bit. I was like, if you made it, you better know what it means. You better be able to explain it. Um, and I watched a interview with with David Lynch and anytime anyone ever asks him anything about his movies, he just does not, he will not tell you. Really? He's like, if they're like, what does it mean? He's like, no, that's not how this works. Like your interpretation of it is a step in the artistic process and whatever I have to say about it, like that's for that. me, I respect that. but that's not for you. Oh. Like, which, you know, I, I have, I also appreciate artists that well, yeah, I think will it de- go into I think it like depends on how an experience. artist approaches their art. Like some people go in with it with like a theme, like I want to convey this thought or I want to convey this expression or theme. And other people are just like, these lyrics kind of came to me and we'll see where they go. And, and I like both a lot. Mm-hmm. I always think it's cool. I, I like enjoy hearing what the, honest, um, the artist's like own personal interpretation is because I don't, I guess uh, some people see that as being like, well, this is what you were supposed to think, and if you didn't get that out of it, you did the you you consumed my art wrong. And I don't see it that way. When I see an artist be like, here's what I really, this is what this was about to me, and it feels like it adds another layer of sort of imperfection to it all. Like, ooh, this is what this person intended, but this is what I got out of it. And the fact that someone could try to say one thing and and be saying another to me. Like it's I think I like a sort of middle ground, ground of of an artist saying, "Well, here's what I got out of it. Mm-hmm. Whatever you got out of it's great." Yeah, like, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think that. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, that's something that I've come into. And that's kind of what I'm I just, sensed from him. Yeah, something I'm just coming into recently with art is this idea of like there isn't a like a right interpretation of this art. Yeah, and and really coming into like the really cool thing about artistic expression is it's uh, the, the reception, 
the reception of the viewer is such an important part of the process, like you were saying. Um, and like with Don't Bring a Ladder, I definitely like my my first time hearing it, I thought, oh, it's like, yeah, don't don't bring a ladder to like climb up a little higher after you die. Like my second time hearing it, which is also something he kind of mentioned, like you have a ladder when you have like chores you're doing, you know, like you have a ladder because you're about to clean out the gut doing gutters work. or or retile your roof. Yeah. So it's like these this to do list that you still have that you need this ladder for, like th- get that done before you die. Like, so I've been thinking about that. Like, part of the joy and, and happiness I think we get from life is improving ourselves. Like, is taking yeah. those steps to be better people. But I feel like so much of our religion says that you know after you die, you're kind of done working on yourself. Uh, like, you don't change anymore. Like, you are, you've secured your lot in life. And I get so much happiness from, like, figuring something out that I need to work on and working on it or, like, improving myself as a person. I feel like... Well, I I think the distinction of the way I see it is you don't change what's most important to you. Like, you don't suddenly decide, I'm a bad person, now I'm a good person. Yeah. Um, So you don't change, like, who you are at your core necessarily, but you still grow and, and, and become wiser and perfect things and work on struggles and, but, and but things what it, like that. But I do see that as like when I do those things, it changes who I am at my core. Like that is how I develop myself. Like I become wiser and, you know, all that Eve yeah. um, was talking about, about you're a different person every 10 years. Like I value different things than I did five years ago. I would see like what I am able to interpret as my core is already being fundamentally different in like short periods of time. Yeah, no, I agree. I I, I, I struggle with it in, ter- in terms of hell, I think, the most, because like I'm not a perfect person, so like, but I still enjoy bettering myself uh, in things. So like if I died and went to hell right now, could I still work on improving myself because I get joy out of that? Let's say overall I'm 80% bad right now. So like my core is like selfish. But I still like. I would have estimated like an eighty-five. <laughs> but I still like doing good things and improving myself and figuring out the bad areas and making them good. So even though my regenerative process is not like over the fifty-fifty mark to get me to heaven, so let's say let's just say like right now I died, I would go to hell because I'm bad. But I still like improving myself. Could I still have an opportunity to improve myself when I'm in hell? Um, two things. I think if you're like I like to improve myself and be better, you're not bad. <laughs> but but. I, because that's yeah. what being... I, I know I don't think it's what you're intentionally doing, but the phrasing you're using is sounding like there is like some kind of scale, like I don't know, Egyptian style, where like, that's, do I have this yeah, much badness? Yeah. Am I am I yeeted down to hell? But I think, yeah, I think what Richard is getting at is like if you're trying to improve yourself, then that already is like a massive weight on the other end of the yeah, scale. and it's like, hey, we've got a place for people that are trying to improve themselves. Do you think bad people are trying to improve themselves? No. I think evil, I think people in hell, so there's like stories in the writings about uh, people I mean, yeah, 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 who are in hell that like have these moments of enlightenment where they see that there's a better way to live where they'd be happier and then they decide actively, no, I hate this. I hate this. I want to kill this. I would rather be what I was before. And they kind of fall back into insanity. Um and so, like, I really, I think it's important to drive home that, like, you don't, no one goes to hell by accident. No one's like, shoot, I didn't quite make it. Well, hell bound. Yeah. Like, people that go to hell are people that choose, like, I am going to put my personal pleasure above, so far above the needs of others that I am willing to harm them for my personal satisfaction. Like, that's the kind of person that ends up in hell and no one else. Um, And so I think a lot of people, there's, like, this anxiety of, like, am I good enough? Am I good enough for heaven? And I think that that anxiety is from a good place about you wanting to be good. And people that want to be good, that's what heaven is. It's a bunch of people that want to be good. Yeah. Um, so, So, yeah, I think it's easy to fall into this, like... Am, ha, have I crossed the mark? Like, have I have I spanned over? And I think people are often really hard on themselves. And and the thing is that like, are like my bad habits aren't necessarily part of me, 
right? Like if I am inclined to say harsh things, but I never say harsh things, I'm not a harsh person. Like I'm just, I'm not. But my internal dialogue has harshness in it. So I see myself as a harsh person. My doctor's calling me. I need to take this. This is a show. Your phone should have been silenced. I don't know what this joker is doing. Unprofessional. Oof. Please take it on air. <laughs> <laughs> but to finish my thought with Luke not here, um, I think we define ourselves by our internal process and we don't choose what thoughts come into our head, right? Mm-hmm. But we define ourselves by those so often. But we should really, what we should really define ourselves by are the things that we allow ourselves to act on and and give importance to. And so like I do kind of think sometimes that I am like a a harsh and rude person um and like a, a aggressive and biting person. And then when I step back from it, in reality, I don't often do that. And I think everyone does it once in a while, but I have like a I struggle with judgmental thoughts, but I don't often act or I try not to, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think defining yourself by what you see as important, not what you're currently struggling with, because what you're currently struggling with, like Eve was talking about, changes so much all the time throughout your life. But I think that much more steady is the direction you're striving, right? And that's what is the determining factor in you between heaven and hell. It's not like, what am I dealing with right now? Ooh, bad stuff? Hell darn. It's like, what have I been striving for my whole life? You know, what is my, what is my path that I've been trying to walk? Um, yeah, dog. Yeah, it was awesome. This was a really fun episode. Uh, I mean, obviously, he wanted to like talk, we talked about spirituality and got really out, out there, but he just felt very grounded to me, you know? Like I also, earth kind of I do hope he releases a single called Entree Bucket. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. What do you have to to say? Get out of here. Go live your life. Be have your day. Get out of here. Roll set outro. Wait, should we do like a quick uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off bit then? What are you still doing here? Yeah, what are you still doing here? Get out. Podcast over. Podcast done. Chicka chicka. Okay. (laughs) Oh yeah. Hi, thanks for listening. If you like the show, here are some things you can do. If you're listening to the audio right now, you can go to YouTube to our Spiritable channel and check out the video there. As always, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell, all that jazz. But uh, the biggest thing you could probably do is tell your friends about the show because word of mouth is really useful. And also, if you go on iTunes and leave us a review, it helps us out a lot and bumps us up in the algorithm. So that would be great if you could do that for us.